you're paying for it, right? You get injectable cardiovascular disease, systemic inflammation by using these products that have not been brewed properly. They already got your money, you're paying the price. So what can we do to test if our carrier oil is actually a synthetic solvent and highly inflammatory? The first thing you can do before going in for blood work, which is probably the best way to determine if you have systemic inflammation, first thing you can do at home is take a little drop of the carrier oil that you want to inject, put it on your finger, and try to rub the ink off an insulin syringe or a three milliliter syringe, right? If the ink comes off, then it's very likely that the carrier oil is actually a synthetic solvent and will cause you systemic inflammation. Keep in mind that this is not 100% foolproof because the MCT oil does rub the ink of an insulin syringe, even though MCT oil is not inflammatory at all. And a wretch's oil doesn't rub the ink off, but is inflammatory in some people. Cottonseed and grapeseed oil shouldn't wipe the ink off a syringe, but if it contains ethyl oleate, then it will surely wipe it off, right? Ethyl oleate will wipe the ink off the syringe like it's going out of style. Second thing you can do is preload insulin syringes or three milliliter syringes with about half a cc of the oil that you want to use. Leave it in the closet for a week, ideally at room temperature, um, you know, let's say 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, right? If it's that hot in your country. Leave it there for a week and see what happens to the rubber plunger. If the rubber stopper or plunger swells up to two, three times its size, like a freaking tampon, then it's very likely that the carrier oil is a synthetic solvent and it's actually eating away at the rubber plunger, um, which you can then actually inject if you proceed with your preloaded insulin syringes for the next couple of days, right? I mean, if the rubber stopper is actually dissolving and parts of the rubber is separating, leaking into the carrier oil, the synthetic solvent, and you start to inject this unknowingly, guess what? That rubber will stay behind in the injection depot indefinitely, right? It's not like it's magically going to metabolize from your intramuscular injection over the next couple of decades. Now it will stay there, it will get encapsulated, and now you have additional scar tissue, right? It's not cool, don't do it. Now, unfortunately, if you preload your insulin syringes with MCT oil, this might still happen, where the rubber plunger just swells up to three times its size. So again, it's not a 100% foolproof method. Um, I would not consider preloading my insulin syringes or three milliliter syringes with any kind of steroid unless you absolutely have to. And it would still be better to transfer the contents of um, a multitude of different vials or ampules that you want to use this week for uh, a sterile vial and then you draw what you need on the day of administration. At least with sterile vials, these oils remain in a glass container, similar to the vials or ampules that these oils came from. Oils are not meant to be stored in plastic for longer periods of time. Otherwise, whatever contents is made up of the plastic or the rubber stopper will dissolve, leak into the oil, which you're now going to inject. And if this doesn't really make it clear to you, the next thing you can try is subcutaneous administrations of 0.1 milliliter of the product that you want to use. See how you respond. Do you get post-injection pain? Any redness at the injection site? Or inflammation? Or lumpiness, right? If any of those occur, then it could be that the oil is inflammatory, a synthetic solvent. If you go with sub-Q over intramuscular administrations, um, at least it won't impact your training if you have a little bit of a lumpy, bumpy area. But if you go IM and you get really a bad response, then obviously you won't be able to train. So with ev whenever you start to use a new product and you don't exactly know what the carrier oil is, you're under willing to undergo that risk. Subcutaneous administrations first, then after a week of 0.1 milliliter sub-Q injections, going for blood work. Check your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, creatine phosphokinase, lactose dehydrogenase enzymes, liver enzymes, ALT and AST, high sensitivity C-reactive protein and homocysteine levels. If any of these are elevated beyond baseline, especially high sensitivity C-reactive protein, you see anything over one milligram per liter and you're 100% sure that you were not in an inflammatory state before you start dabbling with these subcutaneous micro-administrations, throw it in the trash. Respect yourself, don't use this product, it's not sustainable for long-term use, even for short-term use. Dude, you'll feel horrible the longer you use it, please don't do it. Dude, I can't believe you didn't take PUFA content into consideration, holy sh bro. Polyunsaturated fats are mad toxic and highly inflammatory. No, you f***ing deal though. PUFA content only matters when you cook with cooking oil. The melting point of the esterified steroids is usually much lower than the smoke point or the flaming point temperatures of the carrier oils that they're dissolved in. But 
that isn't always the case. So fair point, mate. Let's dive in. Here are all the PUFA content of the commonly used carrier oils. And here you see that castor oil and MCT oil are less than 1% polyunsaturated fat content and coconut oil is about 2 to 3% PUFAs. So if you're worried about PUFAs and smoke points, stick to castor oil, coconut oil, or MCT oil formulations. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the smoke point of the carrier oils and the melting point at which these esterified steroids dissolve into the carrier oil and the benzyl benzoate benzoyl alcohol solution. Find out if the melting point of steroids is higher than the smoke point of the respective carrier oil. That would obviously cause some issues, right? Again, the smoke point of an oil is where fat reaches its burning point, meaning that the lipids start to break down and release chemicals. Some of these chemicals can evaporate and turn into smoke. These chemicals are considered to be free radicals, which cause oxidative stress and damage your cells. Phytochemicals and nutrients also break down when heating oils. And in many cases, these nutrients and phytochemicals already break down far before the oil reaches its smoke point. That being said, a refined carrier oils usually don't contain phytochemicals or nutrients and their smoke points are slightly higher compared to their raw unfiltered counterparts. So when we look at the smoke point of carrier oils used in pharmaceutical formulations, we have to look towards the higher end of the temperature range, which is a smoke point of refined carrier oils. So let's have a look at the melting points of the various esterified steroids that we tend to use, some of which have reasonably high melting points, and if your memory was good, you see that the melting points of these esterified steroids might be slightly higher than the smoke points of the commonly used carrier oils. We might have a problem here. You see that boldenone and destinate is actually melting at room temperature between 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, but dihydroboldenone cypionate melts at 192 to 196 Celsius. Down the list, We'll start mixing and comparing a little bit later on. Let's just uh, keep the scroll going so we have a firm understanding of what the melting points of these esterified steroids and suspensions are actually going to be when you dissolve them in particular carrier oils in a home brewing process. Funnily enough, you see that testosterone suspension, trembolone suspension and stenazolol suspension have a much higher melting point than the boiling point of water. Right? Suspensions are usually suspended in water. But if the melting point is significantly higher, this kind of explains why suspensions always crash. Now, don't worry if your memory isn't that great because you didn't watch the Entrepreneur Nootropic Deep Dive video series. I broke it all down for you, matched particular steroid esters and their melting point to particular carrier oils and their smoke points and start comparing, see which formulations actually make sense and which certainly don't. And well, there are some problems to say the least. Let's get started with Arachis oil. You see that the smoke point of Arachis oil is between 160 to 232 degrees Celsius. Again, refined Arachis oil is more towards the top of this temperature range. You see that testosterone propionate, phenylpropionate, isocuprate, enetate, decanoate, and nandron decanoate all fall well below this temperature range. So those are all suitable to be um, melted into Arachis oil, besides Sustanon 250, which has a melting temperature range between 153 to 157 degrees Celsius, which is very close to the bottom end of the smoke point temperature range of Arachis oil. Keep in mind that Arachis oil is refined peanut oil, so we're looking towards the higher end of the temperature range, um, which is still eerily close to Trimblone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate with a melting point temperature range of 183 to 186 degrees Celsius, which uh, falls basically in the middle of the temperature range of Arachis oil. Moving over to castor oil with a smoke point temperature of 200 degrees Celsius, the melting point of testosterone enetate, undecanoate, and methanolone enetate is far below the smoke point of castor oil. So castor oil, Vigor Steve, approved. Next is coconut oil with a smoke point temperature range from 177 to 204 degrees Celsius. So basically all steroid esters up to 177 degrees Celsius are suitable to be dissolved in coconut oil. Besides dihydroboldenone cypionate, right, that 196 degrees Celsius is very close to the top of the temperature range of coconut oil. Same with trembolone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate, are also very close, at least within the temperature range that coconut oil starts to smoke. Trembolone suspension uh, comes close to the bottom of the range, and stenazolol suspension. Um, is far higher. So if you find this denazolol suspension brewed in coconut oil, stay clear. 
The temperatures clearly don't match. This product might be rancid or highly inflammatory. And even though coconut oil is a suitable carrier oil that doesn't cause systemic inflammation, if the temperature is brought up too high to dissolve and suspend sinusal suspension into this coconut oil formula, um, it's probably not a good idea to use that long term. It appears that cottonseed oil with a smoke point between 220 to 230 degrees Celsius is suitable for all esterified steroids up to a melting point of 196 degrees Celsius. Testosterone cypionate specifically has a melting point at 50% of the smoke point of cottonseed oil. So all pharmaceutical testosterone cypionate formulations in cottonseed oil vigorously approved, but I will say that the melting point of dihydrobaldenone cyprinate is about 10% off the smoking point of cottonseed oil. And with trimbalone hexahydrobenzocarbonate, it's about 15% off the smoking point. So if there's something going wrong in the brewing process with underground labs or home brewing for that matter, and you bring up the temperature too high to the point dihydrobaldenone cyprinate and trimbalone hexahydrobenzocarbonate do dissolve in cottonseed oil, but it also reaches the smoke point of cottonseed oil, then obviously the product is now rancid and might cause systemic inflammation. So please be careful if you're a home brewer. And the same can be said for grapeseed oil with a smoke point temperature range from 199 to 216 degrees Celsius. And dihydrobaldenone cypionate and trimbalone hexahydrobenzocarbonate come eerily close to the bottom of this smoke point temperature range. With MCT oil, the smoke point is significantly lower, 160 degrees Celsius. So all esterified steroids with the melting point below 160 degrees Celsius are suitable for MCT oil, but that excludes dihydrobaldenone cypionate and trimbalone hexahydrobenzocarbonate and trimbalone suspension and sinazolol suspension, which have a higher melting point than the smoke point of MCT oil. And even sustenon 250 and testosterone suspension, um, again, come very, very close to the smoke point of MCT oil. So um, you have to be very selective on which esterified steroid or um, suspension you use in MCT oil. Luckily, with olive oil, we're good to go, but underground labs don't really use olive oil, neither do home brewers. So we're only left with Galenica Serbia testosterone enitate because the Q Pharma testosterone cypionate contains ethyl oleate, and that's not suitable 100%. Moving over to peach seed oil with a smoke point temperature of 101 degrees Celsius, you see that testosterone propionate, phenyl propionate, cypionate, and sustenone 250 all have a higher melting point than the smoking point, so those are not suitable. Even though testosterone isocuparate and the canoate have a lower melting point than the smoking point, uh, testosterone propionate and phenyl propionate are all part of the sustenone 250 blend, that Balkan Pharmaceutical has in peach seed oil. So basically all that you're left with is a testosterone enitate and testosterone undecanoate, which have a lower melting point than the smoke point, right? Those two out of a couple different ones that Balkan Pharmaceutical produces. And then we have sesame oil where the melting point of the esterified steroid is about, let's say 50% of the smoke point. So we're good to go there. And then last on the list, tea seed oil with a smoke point of 252 degrees Celsius. All esterified steroids can be dissolved in tea seed oil. Unfortunately, there's only one underground lab that actually uses it. Now, this is just food for thought. This is me analyzing the numbers on paper. Keep in mind that I'm not a home brewer. I don't have any experience home brewing myself. I'm sure in the comment section, a knowledgeable home brewer will pop up who can teach us and explain how to safely circumnavigate the discrepancy between the smoke point and the carrier oil and brew esterified steroids, in particular carrier oils, safely. Still, with the knowledge I just gave you, I would proceed with caution. If you see that your underground lab is using MCT oil, it's probably best to stay away from the dihydrobaldenone cypionate or the trimbalone hexahydrobenzocarbonate, the parabolin, or the trimbalone suspension or the stenazolol suspension purely based on these temperature ranges. And the same can be said for underground labs who use cottonseed oil or grapeseed oil. The smoke point temperature is very close to the melting point of dihydrobaldenone cypionate and trimbalone hexahydrobenzocarbonate. So guess what? If they f up in the brewing process and the temperature goes too high, you're paying for it, right? You get injectable cardiovascular disease, systemic inflammation by using these products that have not been brewed properly. They already got your money, you're paying the price. So what can you do to stay healthy and not give yourself cardiovascular disease as you're trying to gain a little bit more size and improve the overall quality of life in the short and 
in the long term, say it with me now, pharmaceutical grade that doesn't contain a righteous oil or ethyl oleate or homebrew yourself so you can control all of the variables, but you better damn well make sure that you know what you're doing by signing up for Jace Iron's membership site where you discuss this homebrewing at length. And if you live in the United States and you want to test your blood work parameters, which could be skewed due to systemic inflammation, particularly high sensitivity C-reactive protein, look no further than Merrick Health. I have a discount code called Vigorous, which will give you 10% off of all blood work parameters that Merrick Health has on offer. So if you want to check your inflammatory markers, 10% off. If you want to check your comprehensive hormone panel, 10% off, right? Plus, they have excellent healthcare providers who can help you interpret your results in case something is off and guide you through the process of getting yourself healthy again. Oh, and by the way, on this YouTube channel, you'll find a boatload of different videos discussing everything you need to know, how to stay as healthy as possible while using performance enhancing drugs. All you need to do is subscribe, bro. All right, that's it for this deep dive. I hope it was informative. I hope you can make some better decisions going forward. I really hope that none of the viewers watching this video will ever be inflamed ever again. And if you're never inflamed and you stay healthy and you don't die for cardiovascular disease, well, hit that like button, put another comment, fuel the algorithm. Let's make sure that the entire world will watch this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve, Vigor's crew. You guys know what to do. A non-inflamed front double bicep for you guys.